This episode of Harvey Brownstone Interviews is brought to you by Breakfast at Dominique's, Hollywood's most prestigious coffee company. They've created a series of coffee blends to honor the legacies of many legendary stars, including Joan Crawford, Betty Davis, Boris Karloff, Mary Pickford, Ava Gardner, Harold Lloyd, Ella Fitzgerald, and Bozo the Clown. If you're looking for a great cup of coffee, give Breakfast at Dominique's a try. You can order any of these stars' coffees at hollywoodblends.com. So why not have a cup while you're watching our show and add a touch of Hollywood to your day? Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today's guest is the son of one of the most glamorous and fascinating screen goddesses in cinematic history. At one time, she was considered the world's most beautiful woman, Hedy Lamarr. She lit up the screen in films like Algiers, Boomtown, Ziegfeld Girl, and Samson and Delilah. But what very few people knew until her son made a point of bringing worldwide awareness to it is that Hedy Lamarr was not just an actress. She was a mathematical and scientific genius. At the beginning of World War II, she and composer George Anthill developed a radio guidance system using frequency hopping spread spectrum technology for allied torpedoes intended to defeat the threat of jamming by the Axis powers. The technology that she invented is largely responsible for the creation of wireless communications, including cell phones, GPS, Wi-Fi, and Bluetooth. She was inducted into the National Inventors Hall of Fame in 2014. Our guest produced a fascinating documentary in 2004 called Calling Hedy Lamarr, and he also appeared in the 2017 documentary entitled Bombshell, The Hedy Lamarr Story. He is Hedy Lamarr's son, Anthony Loder. Anthony, welcome to our show, and thank you so much for joining us. It's my pleasure, Harvey. Thank you for asking me. Now, Anthony, you are the son of Hedy Lamarr and actor John Loder. Your parents divorced in 1947, the very year you were born. So you were essentially raised by a single mother. Tell us about your childhood. Well, when I was born, Hetty was a mom when she had time to be a mom. There was nannies and all that to, to do the hard work. But she was, you know, lovely. And uh, as we were kids growing up, we moved from a really nice house on 919 North Roxbury Drive. When they divorced, we moved into Bungalow One of the Beverly Hills Hotel. And then we moved down to Acapulco, Mexico. Hetty married Teddy Stopper, whom she met on her honeymoon with my father, John Loder, in Acapulco. All of Hetty's husbands were rather weak and they drank a lot, which Hetty didn't like and didn't do. Hetty used to bounce us on her knee, singing Austrian songs, and singing, and how much is that dog in the window? So she, you know, she sang songs to us, and we had good times. And then when Hetty was on edge, and when things weren't going smoothly in her direction, she was extremely excitable and angry and they didn't have the medication that they have these days. So we walked on eggshells a lot growing up. I, I dropped a fork and bam, she smacked me across the face. Whatever I dropped something, you pick it up. So she was very uh, erratic and uh, tense. And, uh, you know, the bigger the front, the bigger the back. So she had a nice front. She had a uh, a, a backside too. I mean, all these Hollywood people do. You all think it's really nice and great, but it's actually a living hell. These people, they're used to getting what they want. They're put up on a pedestal. So they're kind of not normal people anymore. So when did you realize that your parents were famous? Well, I knew something was weird when there was always a crowd around us and when people all came up to her, may I have your autograph all the time. So Hedy took us out for ice cream at Will Wright's ice cream store in Beverly Hills. And people used to come up, may I have your autograph, may I have your autograph. And, you know, we knew Hedy was different. She was driving, she ran a red light, motorcycle cop came up, 
Oh, Hedy Lamar. Well, you take your kids out for ice cream now. Bye bye. You know, so Hedy never waited in line. She always walked up to the front of a movie theater line and walked right in, uh, which bothered me. So, you know, I didn't particularly like, you know, the unique behavior that that the public gave someone who was an actress in the movies. She got a lot of attention that that wasn't really long-term valuable attention. Oh, how beautiful you are. She just got sick of hearing how beautiful she was all the time. And she was thirsting for, you know, some other connection. Your, your mom's parents were both Jewish, but she was raised as a Catholic. Do you know why? She was raised with no religion. When Hitler started persecuting Jews, everybody saw what was going on. And when Hedy got married to Fritz Mandel, a munitions giant in Austria, they changed their religion on the marriage certificate from Jewish to Roman Catholic. So, but Hedy didn't wait to be interviewed or arrested or whatever. She actually escaped from their home. Actually, she put on a maid's costume and she actually sewed jewelry in the lining of her coat and she escaped out the window and she took off. I was given Hetty's mother's side family tree and it goes way, way back a couple hundred years. And there was, you know, Moses the tailor and Jacob the banker. So definitely Jewish. They didn't talk about being Jewish because it was a death sentence, basically. So they just weren't religious, really. Your mom was an extremely famous and popular movie star, and she was quickly typecast as an exotic and glamorous actress. But she wasn't very happy with the kinds of roles they were giving her in Hollywood because they couldn't get past her beauty to see that she had brains as well. I just find that so sad, Anthony, don't you? I find my mother's life tragic, tragic, tragic. One of the really, really touching things that happened with my mother is we were living in a house on on Bubbly Drive after she divorced Howard. And I used to help my mom with this or that. And she woke up one afternoon, one, two o'clock, the way she always did. And she was sitting up wearing a, a blue silk nightgown and and in a, in a king size bed next to an empty king size bed, a double king size bed. And she was sitting up all by herself in this bed, a little figure in this giant bed. And I was standing there waiting to see what she wanted. And she gazed out the window. And she said, you know, sometimes I feel like I'm in a little rowboat in the middle of the ocean all alone with no one. And it just touched me. I, it, just, it just moved me. And, and no matter how bad my mother was, I endured it and it passed and she became warm and loving again. But she was erratic and, and had, had to walk on eggshells with her the way the world did for 10 years because they wanted their jobs and they wanted to, to do whatever she wanted. And she was used to that. And she never faced the real world about writing checks and paying her bills and uh, parking tickets and licenses. Everyone always took care of those details. Now, all of a sudden, she had to do it all on her own. And she was kind of lost. Did she ever tell you what her favorite film was? I think it was Samson and Delilah. It was kind of prestigious for her to work with Cecil B. DeMille toward the and, you know, when she was older, when her career was kind of fading, uh, Cecil B. DeMille asked her to, to, to play Delilah. And that was uh, an honor, kind of. And she was telling me how close she was and how much she loved him. And once in, in, in the house in Houston, Texas, we were sitting there at a card table next to the pool. And she, she told me this joke that Cecil B. DeMille told her. And, and it went like this. He said, he says, I was filming a scene with 10,000 extras in the background. And, and 
I had four cameras set up all over the place and, and ready action. And the crowd ran in, the buildings caught on fire and tumbled. And, and when it was all over, the dust settled and everyone was dead down there and cut and say, camera one, how was it? The, the, the film jam, CB, the film jam. Camera two, how was it? Uh, CB, I was out of focus. We were out of focus. I didn't get it. Oh, my God. Two other cameras left. Camera three, did you get it? The, the tripod failed. Oh, my God, the last camera. Camera four, how was it? Ready when you are, CB. <laughs> so he didn't even turn the camera on yet. So, you know, had he liked that. But getting back to the the two sides of my mother, the scientific side and the actress side or the bright minded side and the short term movie actress side of her. You know, there was a long term science side and a short term beautiful side. Well, the rumor has it that she became an inventor because she was so bored with the work she was getting in Hollywood. She had no formal training. She was self-taught. Is that true? She was a bright minded woman. She didn't study math or writing or reading or anything, really. I mean, she went to school to the finest Swiss schools and uh, and she ran away from school. She had an affair. Actually, she had an abortion when she was young. And this rich German killed himself over it. So that was was something that nobody knows about. But when did you learn that she was a brilliant inventor? When I was seven years old, she took me up to the attic in the house in Houston to go through some boxes she had in storage. Basically, she wanted company. So as she was going through the boxes, she took out, well, here's a key to the city of New Jersey that I got. All these magazines with mom on the cover. Wow, that's pretty. Oh, that's nice. Oh, yeah. And then photographs. And and then she took out a a paper and she said, this is a, a patent I got for a secret communication system. What's a patent, mom? What's an idea I had? And I gave it to the government and they gave me a patent, which means it was my idea. And George Antile, he was a composer friend of mine and he helped me put it on paper and he helped me figure out a way to make it work. It was my idea what to do and it was his idea on how to do it. She went to him about, look, I got this idea about how to help win the war. And it's like a secret communication system where you can't jam or interfere with the radio signals, really. But I don't know how to make it work. I want to make a patent. So George Antel later on came up with the idea of using piano rolls to sync with the, with each other, with the sender and receiver, the piano rolls would change the frequencies all the time where no one could jam a sending frequency or a receiving frequency. They only had sending and receiving frequencies and the enemy got in there and listened or got in there and jammed it. But now Hetty thought, why don't we just in the air change these frequencies with each other constantly? And that was called frequency hopping or spread spectrum technology. And that is the basis of Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, GPS, smartphones, computers, laser bombs. You know, Hetty was usually 20 years ahead of her time in, in, in taking off her clothes in the movies and in, in, in this idea of frequency hopping. So finally, when technology created integrated circuits when everything gets got small enough where they could do what Hetty was saying to do. They did it with submarines, torpedoes, uh, computers on board, $28 billion satellites going around where any soldier could talk to any soldier anywhere on the planet. And it took 20 years for the United States to incorporate her idea and they, she had a patent in 1942. In 1962 was the Cuban Missile Crisis. And they had her technology on 
American warships during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Well, before we get to that, uh, apparently Howard Hughes was one of the few people in Hollywood who actually appreciated that your mother was a genius inventor. Do you know much about how she helped redesign his airplanes? Yeah, up in that attic, had he told me, after she said, look, I got a patent. Wow, well, and she told me what a patent was and, and what her patent was about. And then she said, well, I also uh, thought about the wings on airplanes being bent backwards. I said, you know, I, I saw birds and fish and, and I, I figured out that the wings straight out are less effective than the winds bent back. So I told my friend Howard Hughes to bend the winds back on his airplanes. So eventually they did do that. And I don't, Hetty didn't get the credit, but she thought of it before anyone else did. I, she, was, she thought of things to take wrinkles away. She thought of little cubes to drop into water, to turn into Coca-Cola for soldiers to use out in the field. And, you know, she was always creative. Uh, well, she- you know, the thing that really disturbs me the most about your mother's inventions is that because the patent on her inventions ran out too soon, her technology, which, as you said, is the cornerstone for wireless communications that we use in our everyday lives, it brought her no money. That's just so unfair. I think it's tragic. She gave her patent to the government for free. She said, use this to stop the war. Beat Hitler, win the war. This is for the Allies. This is for you. Take it. So they took it and they kind of shelved it. But other scientists pulled it off and actually incorporated before the patent ran out. So the patent ran out in 17 years. She could have renewed it, but she kind of gave it away to help win the wars. So Hedy's idea was really, really, really huge. I mean, she'd be right up there with, you know, Bill Gates money wise. But, you know, she died basically penniless. Another reason I find that so heartbreaking is that one of the things many people may not know about your mom is that she was very patriotic and supportive of the U.S. war effort. She sold a staggering $25 million in war bonds in 10 days, which is astounding. I mean, you must be incredibly proud of that. I'm proud of my mother. And and then I saw the other side. I saw the pain and anguish and I saw the uh, what it did to people, you know, how, you, how when you boost them up so high on a pedestal and when you walk on eggshells around them, they're, they're used to being a queen. So she, there she was, a queen dumped where, where, where nobody, nobody cared about her anymore. In uh, 2000, when, when Hetty passed away, you know, I said, well, how can I look for the good and, and praise it. How can I help my mother's legacy? And it's all about, with me, it's all about her legacy. I don't want her legacy to be the most beautiful woman in the world because that faded. But she was so ahead of her time. In 1945, after leaving MGM, she created her own production company and she starred in two great movies. I love them. The Strange Woman and Dishonored Lady. That was unheard of at the time, Anthony, for an actor, especially a woman, to take charge of her career like that. What an amazingly strong-willed woman she must have been. She also produced uh, her own film, The Love of Three Queens. And she went to Europe. It was about three women and and their, their loves and what happened. And she made that movie in color and she cut it and produced it. And it was nice. And she played the three parts and no one would distribute it. No one would show it. So she had this film in reels, but no one would screen it, you know. And so she was a woman and a producer all alone. And so there she was with a few million dollars that she spent, the last of her money. And it it was just in a film can. Tell us about your 2004 documentary, Calling Hedy Lamar. What made you decide to produce it, Anthony? Really, really nice friend of mine who's a, a Austrian film director reached out to me and he said, you know, I'm Georg Misch and I'm in Vienna. Oh, wow, I love that. 
and I want to make a movie about your mom. I uh, says, can you produce it with me? So well, I got together with him and, and we produced Calling Hedy Lamar. And it's a really good, informative movie. Bombshell the Hedy Lamar story. If, if I think uh, Amazon Prime has it, whoever hasn't seen it, they should look at it because it's such a moving, informative film. It's so well made. We made it once and then we threw out everything we did in two years and uh, Alex Dean, the director, she started all over again because they found some tapes that Eddie recorded. And instead of me being the narrator the way I was in calling Eddie Lamar, she wanted the tapes and Hetty to be the narrator. And then I ended up playing a small role in it, just talking basically about the scientific part of my mom and a little personal stuff. My mother was unique. She was so creative and I just grew up in such an unusual way. I was coddled when I was a baby. I had everything I want. And then I was dropped like my mother was, left alone in boarding schools and with a man named Marvin Neal, who she hired to be our father, basically. And I grew up in a strange environment and understanding how how fraudulent and fake the, the, the movie world was. They, they said one thing about you and turned around and, and did the opposite. And, well, and, and you mentioned this man. Your mom was married six times. Do you think she was ever truly loved for who she was by any of these men? No. No. Hedy's children loved her. And Hedy never found love. Ten million people loved Hedy Lamar. Oh, I love her. I love her. I love her. Nobody loved Hedy Lamar. No one. No one. She had no love and support. No one. No one took care of Hetty ever. Well, the last few decades of her life really were very sad. Her behavior became kind of erratic. She was basically living in seclusion. There are even rumors that she was a victim of the infamous Dr. Feelgood, Max Jacobson, who injected his patients with methamphetamines. Is that what changed her personality so much? Yes, yes. Drugs did. You know, uh, MGM Studios, they gave her a pill to wake up, to go to a party. They put her a pill to go to sleep and she couldn't wake up at four in the morning to get makeup. Here's this pill. You'll feel a lot better. What is it? It's a vitamin pill. So she got hooked on pills without knowing it at MGM. And she was like really nervous and really hype and, you know, really a monster. Uh, I didn't you know, she got so bad, we didn't recognize who she was. And then all of a sudden, she was mom again. So it was hot, cold, hot, cold. And it was well, weird. and you, you in the documentary Bombshell, you described her as a woman of extremes, didn't you? Yeah, she was. I mean, nothing was centered for her. It was all one thing or another. It was all way up or way down. Toward the end of her life, you know, she was living alone in an apartment and it, with cockroaches and people would come to visit her and steal old photographs and jewelry and, and things. It was all gone. I, I know uh, uh, one guy who, who, who did a lot of harm. I won't mention his name, but it was really sad. You know, Hedy used to invite people over. Come on over. Let's let's cook dinner. Bring some steaks and and some some of this and some of that. So they came over and she put it in the fridge and she talked and oh, let me make some sandwiches. Let's have some sandwiches. It'd be faster. And she made sandwiches for everyone. She kept the steak for herself to eat. You know, after they left, and she cooked that type of food. But uh, it it's she just had people acting like they were her best friend and they were just users and and takers. And then she sued Mel Brooks for creating a character named Hedley Lamar in his movie Blazing Saddles. And they settled out of court. It just, it seems clear to me that your mom felt very misunderstood, very betrayed by the film industry in Hollywood. She did. She felt like she never got her dues. And she didn't No, They didn't know what to do with her. No one took the time to understand her. And, and she was betrayed. She wasn't taken care of. She wasn't guided. Well, what I think is they never created parts for her. They always grabbed the script and say, oh, the script calls for a beautiful girl. Well, let's put Hetty in there, no matter what the part was. So they, like Betty Davis, they wrote parts for her or, you know, other actresses they did the same for. 
but not my mother. They just used like uh, a human adornment. They just, let's put Hedy in, you know, and let's write a part for Hedy Lamar. This will be great. And she'll we'll escalate her to, to a superstar. Nobody ever did that. She, she did her contract. When it was over, she was a little older. She wasn't the most beautiful woman in the world that she used to be. So they just said, goodbye. We don't want you anymore. So she tried making movies on her own and no one would show them. In 1966, a book was published purportedly written by your mother entitled Ecstasy and Me. But she went on the Merv Griffin show to say that she did not write that book and that it was pure fiction. Did she ever write a memoir? I was with Hetty when that book was created. It was called Ecstasy in Me, which, which Hetty thought of the title. But a ghostwriter came over to the house and they had a reel-to-reel tape recorder. And my mother started from day one and, and told this man her life story, uh, every film, all the antidotes, all the husbands, everywhere she lived, uh, what she loved and one evening, I was sitting with my mother on the couch, and it was candles, and it was dark, and we were talking, the doorbell rang, and her manager, Earl Mills, he walked in with this big stack of galleys, these long papers, and, and he says, here it is, <clears throat> here's your book, and my mother put it on her lap, and she, she said, all you have to do is read it and approve it and sign it, and we'll publish it. And then she looked at him, I'll never forget. She said, is this everything I said? She said, yes, it is. So she just signed it without reading it. Oh. Gave it back to him. And then it was kind of a, the publisher in New York got a hold of it. And she said, this is boring, this book. Let's spice it up. Let's get some sex in there. Let's do this. And that. So there was, let's get Hetty making love with a woman. And so, I mean, actually she was bisexual she did need a lot of love my mother but but the book was was trashy and she hated it and it wasn't what she said and when that book came out it devastated my mother and she actually left los angeles she moved away from hollywood to get away from that book she went to new york she stayed at the blackstone hotel and then eventually she moved out of there to a, a doctor's uh, apartment on, on Park Avenue. And then that was a disaster eventually. And, you know, and then she moved to Florida and her, the, the end of her life. Uh, uh, those are details too, but. Well, uh, I want to get into that. Her, she died on January 19th, 2000 at the age of 85. And her ashes were scattered in the Vienna woods in accordance with her wishes Anthony, if you can, can you take us back to that day in Vienna when you finally laid your mother to rest? My mother was in a drawer in a bag at Georg Misch, the Austrian director who did Calling Hedy Lamar. It was in his drawer in his house for 10 years. Georg Misch and I went to the government of Austria and we had a meeting with him. He said, look, we'd like, you know, I'm all about my mother's legacy and creating her legacy, actually. And because nobody knew about her scientific side at all. Nobody knew. We went to the government. We said, we want a tomb of honor to put her ashes where we're in the, in the cemetery in, in Vienna, where Beethoven and important people are. And we want a tomb of honor for Hetty. We want a street named after Hetty Lamar. And we want a statue in Vienna named after Hetty Lamar. Ten years went by. And finally, the government said, we have a tomb of honor for your mother. But earlier, we had scattered her ashes for the movie. But actually, in the movie, what we threw in the air was campfire ashes that we collected. My sister didn't want to film her ashes being scattered. So we went to the campfire up there at, at I'm Himmel, which is in heaven, a, a place in the movie, you'll see it. And we went to a campfire and gathered these ashes 
Then we threw campfire ashes in the air and then we cut the camera, the film crew went away and my sister and I actually took half of Hedy's ashes and threw them into the Vienna woods and we kept the other half and we put them in the tomb of honor that Vienna gave Hedy. And she's now in a tomb of honor with 88 ro- uh, stainless steel rods with 88 balls that if you stand uh, at the foot of her grave, you can see an image of her face on these 88 frequencies, 88 piano keys. So we made a, her, her tomb of honor with, with radio hopping frequencies with an artistic statement. So Anthony, what do you think your mother would think of the renewed interest in her career and her inventions because of those two documentaries? She would be really, really happy. She, you know, she says it's about time she got recognition. And I think she was kind of proud that I I took it upon myself to support that part of her life and to popularize that nobody knew about it. And, And I thought, you know what? I'm going to look for the good and I'm going to, there's a lot of bad in my mother. There's a lot of horrible things she did to her children. She was abusive, but I understand why. I understand the drugs. I understand Hollywood. I understand what they did to her and they created a monster. And, but she was warm and loving too. You know, I hugged her and kissed her. And when I was little, uh, learning how to walk, I was in front of the house at night she was wearing a big old fur coat the way she did. And her face was all white the way it was. She opened her fur coat. She said, come to the womb, come to the womb. And I ran up and grabbed her thighs and she put the coat around me, smelled like a field of flowers. And she rocked me back and forth. You did it. You did it. You could do anything you want. So I remember things like that. And, you know, there was really, really good warm moments. And there was cold foreign moment I didn't recognize who she was and and she was caught in the middle poor thing you know poor thing you know Anthony I'm surprised so far nobody's made a feature film about your mother's life don't you think her life would be the perfect subject for a movie after Bob show came out you know a lot of people were interested and you know we tried to do it before you know Diane Kruger we actually I gave her a two-year contract with a two-year extension to play Eddie Lamar, but she didn't even try. She didn't even think about it or talk about it or no script. So I took away the rights from her and she got freaked out. Oh, no. But Gal Gadot, who is my first choice to play my mother, she signed up and we signed a contract for her. I think Apple TV is going to do it now to make like an eight-part series of Hedy's life, she has a contract to play Hedy Lamar. So that's that's in the pipeline. So let's hopefully it'll happen. Oh, Uh, I hope so, Anthony. There's one thing that I'm working on now is I set up all my archives and went to Vienna to the Jewish Museum. And they opened an exhibit called Lady Bluetooth, which was about Hedy and all beautiful items there. And then I was there for the opening and in a little cafe, there was Austrian dignitaries and and government people. We sat down, we started talking. I said, you know, it would be really nice to, for Vienna to have a permanent Hedy Lamar museum that Austrians can go to and students can go to and tourists can visit and people can talk and develop things. She said, you know, that's a great idea. So right now we have the green light to do a permanent Hedy Lamar Museum in Vienna, Austria. We're looking for a building or a space to do it now. But that's one thing I hope to see before I go. And then this Gal Gadot acting my mother's part, I hope to see that too. So, you know, history is going to remember my mother in a good way. And I'm happy for that. I'm happy. And you have a lot to do with that, Anthony. You can be very proud. I can't wait to see that museum. I can't wait to see the miniseries. I got to tell you, I've really enjoyed celebrating your mother's life and career and scientific achievements. You have so much to be proud of in honoring her amazing legacy 
as an entertainer and as an inventor and just as a survivor, as someone who found a way to just keep going. I, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to come on our show. I must say you did your homework. You did a great job. You knew a lot about my mother and you said just the right things. And it's so nice to participate with you in this. You're very professional and you did an A-plus job. Oh, thank you, Anthony. You're just a treasure. I can't wait to meet you in person. And I hope one day I'll have that honor. Our guest has been Anthony Loader, son of Hedy Lamar. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to our producer, Steve Silver. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out all the great interviews on the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when new videos are posted.